I feel as an author that all the best of one goes into the book, and people who come to meet you um, are left with the husk. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, book lovers in particular, I feel, are short-changed. As uh, Margaret Atwood said, if you like pate, don't bother to meet the duck. <laughs> Well, the duck in question is probably going to say a little bit about his book, which is, um, as we say, utterly different, um, a short, sharp journey uh, across western Nepal to Mount Kailash, the Buddhist holy mountain there. This is an extraordinary mountain, actually, um, just north of the main Himalayan range, um, inside the coldest and most remote part of Tibet. Um, it's holy to one-fifth of humankind. Um, literally all Hindus and Buddhists regard this mountain as the center of the universe. It's never been climbed, um, it's too holy, so people certainly just circumambulate it and, uh, and leave the summit alone. One of the reasons for its sanctity, I think, is that all the four great rivers of the Indian subcontinent arise almost at its foot. Uh, the northernmost source of the Ganges, the Sutlej, the Brahmaputra, the Indus, all by some mysterious um, process arise here, and any Indian in the old days in the plains wanting to seek out sanctity would follow these rivers and arrive eventually, if he survived at all, uh, at Mount Kailash. Those who have attempted to scale it have been um, almost none. Um, it's too scary. Um, the locals in particular um, would disappear you before you reach the summit. There were two. Uh, the only two that I've discovered. Um, they're both Indian Army officers, um, yeah, officers of the Indian Army. One, uh, a Colonel Wilson, who attempted to go with his Sherpa, who was called Satan. Um, he, he, he likened the mountain rather jauntily to a bowler hat and thought that he would ascend it in a couple of days, but was driven back by a freak hailstorm and storm and lightning. Um, they followed shortly after by Major Blakeney, who thought he would get up with his only equipment was a furled umbrella. Um, and he, he also predictably failed. My own motives uh, are rather more shadowy. Um, this sounds rather a dismal thing to say, um, even at an early literary lunch, but my mother had died, my, I had no family left, my sister was dead. I mean, it's not, nothing unusual about a man of my age um, having no siblings or parents left, but I, I wanted to mark it in some way. And um, as uh, Nicolas Bouvier, the, um, the French writer, said, the Swiss writer, um, you think you're making a trip, but after a bit you find the trip is making you. Mm -hmm. And this is a much more personal journey than I've ever done. In fact, personal parts quite few in the book, um, but it, for some, has leaked into my, um, my memories of my parents and their memories of one another, even. Uh, I can just imagine that in the past, certainly, my books, um, people have said they're rather impersonal. I'm sometimes accused of being a little bit too um, occluded in my books. I'm sure now they will go to say, please go back to being impersonal. <laughs> <laughs> We've had enough of you. Um, how about going back to the old, the old scheme of things? Well, um, people always ask me how dangerous it was, and the answer is really not at all. Uh, the altitude is, is, was the great threat to an elder like me. Um, I was less sort of muscularly challenged, as you might say, than by an altitude of almost 19,000 feet. And um, of course, if you get altitude sickness, that's nothing you can do. Um, they say you've just got to you know, come down lower, as if there's a nice little escalator going down from the Tibetan plateau to the Indian plain. So um, that was the thing I feared. Um, it didn't happen. My Sherpa, curious enough, got bad headaches, but I didn't get any. I can't quite explain that. But, um, there was the only moment I sort of apprehended any, any danger was when my Sherpa said, uh, we were approaching a village and I wanted to stay with some of the villagers. And he said, uh, we stay with the family, you will die here. I said, oh, no, no, no. And I said, you know, who's going to kill me uh, if we stay with this family? He said, I did not say die here, I said, you will die here. <laughs> Needless to say, we did die there. <laughs> but we proceeded on eventually to the Tibetan border, where um, it's just a footpath crossing into Tibet, but the, the Chinese police are there, 
and you immediately see the difference in culture between the rather um, robust and cheerful and poor Tibetans and these scrupulously polite and well turned out Chinese officers, a sort of rosy cheeked captain with surgical gloves went hunting through my rucksack for pictures of the Dalai Lama and so on. Um, and, and, and eventually you arrive at a tent which is sort of rigged up uh, by the side of the post saying um, it was for swine flu, I tell you, we were being monitored for swine flu. And this was the last sort of barrier before getting into Tibet with this rather quaint little um, uh, questionnaire. Uh, the last question of which I remember in the rather odd Mandarin translated was, have you had close relations with pig during one week? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, having been clear that this particular relationship, I was able to go on uh, into Tibet, where um, suddenly this most beautiful mountain, Kailash, rises beyond these sacred lakes. Um, you can understand why it was holy. It's simply standing there in the midst of a perfect cone, it looks like, from a distance. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's extraordinary, uh, the actual pilgrimage around it, because it's mostly Tibetans and Hindus. Hindus often who can't make it round, only about a third of them manage to make it round. They're simply not used to those altitudes. Eight of them died on the mountain when I was there. Oh. And um, for the rest, the, the Tibetans with their great lungs and particular blood makeup go twirling around in 36 hours for Hindus, and certainly for me it took uh, three days. And some Tibetans literally will prostrate themselves all the way around, which takes a month. Um, literally, you put your feet where your hands have been in the first prostration, and that way uh, you circle the mountain. Uh, an astonishing thing to see. Well, one of the odd things I found here was that um, the monks in these tiny monasteries, most of them were destroyed in the Cultural Revolution, um, but they've been rebuilt, and you get these very poor monks who um, give you a feeling, as Tibetan monks did in Kathmandu, where I first really encountered them in any numbers, of tremendous robustness and you get sort of almost physical vigor, as the Dalai Lama called it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, one understands, in a way, uh, meeting them, why the monks are the spearhead of rebellion, uh, of revolt in China, um, because they don't seem to be passive at all. Um, and you look at Tibetan history, and you realize that actually that history is full of violence and, and belligerence. Back in the 7th, 8th centuries, um, Tibet was a formidable empire. Its armies, um, who could reach the numbers of 200,000, um, reached the borders of Burma, um, sacked the great Tang Dynasty capital of Xi'an in China, and um, the Tibetan armor was the best in the world. And even in the 14th, 15th centuries, you find these monastic communities um, who were defending their faith with arms. They were fighting civil wars with one another, depending on what sect of Buddhism they followed. And even into the early 20th century, the Dalai Lamas, if they weren't uh, already murdered in childhood, were complicit in violence. So this peaceful image that Tibet has is somewhat modified in history. I asked a Tibetan monk down in Kathmandu um, you know, about this history. He said, you know, monks are, are quite, we're, we're, we're full-bodied, vigorous people. Um, you should see us watching television, he said. <laughs> television, yes. Um, last night, he said, the monks were watching uh, the European Cup, and they got very angry. I said, I said, why? Why did they get angry? And he said, well, they're all followers of Manchester United. And Manchester United had been beaten by Barcelona. And they were very angry because they thought the referee was giving out um, long penalty tickets. You should have seen them. I thought the monks were sort of meditating in the evening. And he said, well, um, maybe it, it, it's a kind of meditation. They concentrate on the ball, and the rest of the world goes away. <laughs> Well, I think my time is up, and I must leave you not in Tibet, but obscurely in Manchester. Thank you very much.